Hi, thank you for vo joining Voyagers National Park Association here from Voyagers National Park as we host our first ever Kids Ask. And just to give you a little bit of information about who we are, VNPA, Voyagers National Park Association, we're the charitable group that supports Voyagers National Park. And we do things like produce these free sessions. We've got some kids videos online that some of you probably are used to. And we're always looking for new members. So check out our webpage if you'd like to become a member of Voyagers National Park. So now we'd like to get started with the main event to the day. So you probably know me if you've watched some of our kids' videos on loons or wolves. I'm your Voyager Explorer. And today I am going to introduce you to the Voyager's wildlife biologist, and he will answer the questions you sent in to us. So just a couple things before we get started that if you're on Zoom, make sure you have your video and audio turned off and type in the chat box, both on Zoom and on Facebook. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd really like to know. Second, thank you to everybody that sent in the tons of questions received, including some of our classes right here at Falls Elementary School. We appreciate all your enthusiasm. So I'm gonna go ahead now and introduce you to Steve Windows, our Voyagers National Park wildlife biologist. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, um, and appreciate you inviting me to do this. This is fun. That's the first kind of uh, um, ask a scientist um, thing that I've been involved with. So um, as you can see, I'm here in my in my office. That's me pointing a thumb back towards my beaver lodge here where I where I work. But um, so we had a lot of great questions, um, lots of questions about wolves and beavers and moose and some other wildlife. Um, so um, I can jump right in there. Um, Jackie, remind me, did you want me to introduce myself or what were we going to do? Go ahead and introduce yourself, Steve, and maybe you sure. tell us what a wildlife biologist does. Thank you for the prompt. Um, okay, so uh, I am a wildlife biologist. I've been uh, doing this as a career for um, close to 30 years now. So um, a wildlife biologist is somebody, a biologist is just somebody that studies biology. It could be biology of any living thing. So uh, whether it's plants or uh, uh, Biologist, but so generally, um, again, wildlife means things, um, land animals with um, with uh, with spines, with backbones, right? Um, but it does sometimes include things like insects and other invertebrates. But so um, so that's generally what a wildlife biologist does. Uh, for me, a wildlife biologist with the National Park Service. Uh, means that I'm responsible for um, monitoring um, all of the wildlife species that occur in the park and making sure that we have functioning ecosystems and that the populations of these animals are 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 doing well. Those species that we think are declining or have been um, exterminated, we either try to restore them or try to increase their populations or better be, basically try to better understand how the parks can manage um, their populations so that um, they're there for future generations. How's that, Jackie? Do I need more? That is great, Steve. So whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and read the questions and answer all the questions we've received. OK, well, we'll try to get through all of the questions we had. I think we had 20 some questions that were submitted. And there may be a few more that uh, if we have time at the end of um, at the end of our session here. But so I'll start out with some questions about wolves and then I'll jump down to some other topics about beavers and we'll kind of, we'll kind of move around uh, topics, but do our best to, to answer all of them. Uh, so a common question we get are how many wolves, um, how many wolves live in the wild in the United States? So at present, um, if we only count the lower 48 states, so not counting Alaska, 
there's about five or 6,000 wolves, between five and 6,000 wolves that live in the lower 48 states. Uh, Minnesota is, um, has lots of wolves and we have about 20, 2,200 to 2,500 wolves. So Minnesota has as much as 40% of the wolves um, that occur in the US. And this part of Minnesota is unique in that we were one of the last places where wolves were never um, um, exterminated basically um, at the end of the 1800s. Pretty much everywhere else in all the other states in the lower 48 wolves had been, um, had been um, removed from the landscape either through shooting or poisoning or um, loss of habitat, any number of things. So we're proud of the fact that this part of Minnesota has always had wolves. Um, another common question we get are how many packs are there in the park? So wolves are territorial animals. Um, they have little, de they have defined spaces. Um, I can actually pull up a picture here. Um, territories we call them or packs that they defend from other wolves. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, put it up as my background. Let's see if this works. Give me one second. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's backwards, isn't it? Somebody help me out, all the writing is backwards. It's not backwards. It looks good to us, Steve. Oh, okay. Then, well, that's good, because in my screen, it shows that everything's backwards, so, um, but that's okay. All right, as long as you can see it, so. Um, but what I want you to see here, so when we talk about wolf packs, each of these outlines um, is the proximate territory boundary for a pack of wolves, so that's usually uh, the, the mating pair, a male and a female that, that have mated and then their offspring. So pups from that year or the year before generally. And they defend each of these territories from other wolves. Um, and you can see they vary in size and shape. Um, and some of the wolf packs, like for example, uh, the one that says Shoeback Lake or Cranberry Bay, those are packs that are all the way inside the park boundaries. And other packs, for example, Lightfoot Pack or Wyopka Pack, they spend part of their time in the park and part of their time outside of the park. So the question we often get is how many packs are there in the park? And it's not easy to, to answer because most of the packs are not all the way in the park. So how we describe it is um, we have as many as three packs that are all totally included within the park and another four to five packs where um, at least the wolves spend some of their time inside the park. And when we're thinking about how um, we manage wolves uh, or monitor wolves in the park. We're thinking about that, about which wolves are actually using parts of the park during different times of the year. Um, and then of course the next logical follow-up question is how many wolves are there in the park? And uh, this is complicated for a couple of reasons. One is um, the number of wolves you can have in any animal population is going to vary from year to year depending on how many wolves are born and how many die, um, how many packs you have, how many wolves are in each pack. And so um, when we estimate the number of wolves that we may have in the park or the park area, it's gonna change from one year to the next, not surprising. Um, and it also depends on when you do the count. So um, pups are born in April and then most of the pups are actually gonna die that first year before, um, before they're one year old from natural causes, starvation, disease, et cetera. So depending on when you make your estimate of how many wolves are in the park is going to depend on what time of year it is. So have they just had all their pups, in which case the population is going to be twice as big as it is at the end of winter when um, you only have those pups that survived the previous year. So most scientists use um, a late winter period to estimate wolf populations because again this is when um, all the pups that have been born um, are basically made it to one year old and um, and it's just a good standardized way to measure or estimate populations. So in our case, um, most years we have between 20 and 30 wolves that will use parts of the park. This is, that, again, that late winter period. Um, so what about wolves, uh, lone wolves? So people have heard this term, lone wolves. Um, where do these lone wolves come from? Well, um, like all young animals, um, after they're born, usually more animals are born than 
Um, then there's resources for space, food, all of those kinds of things. So um, animals have to go and disperse from where they're born to go find their own places to live, to find their own resources, to find mates so that they can have their own offspring. Um, so most wolves will leave the packs from which they're born after their first or second year. And part of this is their own um, young animals have their own internal desire to go and explore and to go and find their own, start their own lives, just like graduating seniors in high school, right? Um, and some of those that um, don't want to leave will often be encouraged to disperse by aggressive behavior from other pack members, generally the parents. But um, And then these wolves will just be wandering around um, out there trying to find a mate or um, available space to start their own pack. Again, wolves are very territorial, so they don't like to tolerate unrelated individuals very well. So. Um, if you're a lone wolf and you don't have the protection of your pack mates, uh, again, it's a tough life trying to keep from getting beat up by all of these other, all of these other wolf packs here that are, that are operating as, um, as pack units, as family units. Okay, so let's, um, let's go jump down to uh, beavers here, which is a favorite topic of mine. I'm going to change my background here. They will let me. Okay, so this is this shows um, what a beaver pond site looks like, and there it breaks down um, some of the different components of that. So, a question: one of the questions that we got about beavers is, um, do beavers have favorite spots to build dams, or how do they choose where to place their dams? And this, of course, um, is a great question. Um, and as I like to say, beavers are actually quite smart for a rodent with a tiny little brain. Um, and you can see here with this spot over my shoulder that says dam. So this is a case where beavers, if, if, if they are given the choice, will, will behave very smartly and they will find those spots where they can build a very narrow, short dam that will make a big pond. So this is sort of the most efficient thing that they can do is um, if you have a small dam that takes very little time to build or maintain and you can create a big body of water, that's obviously the most efficient. Um, and beavers like that they choose these spots first. And then as these spots fill up with beavers, then the other beavers that are out there have to go and maybe go to spots where they have to build a longer dam, for example, to build up or to be able to um, retain the water that they need. Um, and another thing that beavers will do is, again, they're also quote unquote smart in that um, they'll choose to repair an existing dam. So for example, this pond here, beavers built this dam could be 50 years ago. Uh, those beavers come and go, the dam starts to fall apart. Another beaver comes in here and sees this partial dam already here. They're gonna start building a new dam here rather than building or repair this one here rather than building a new one upstream or downstream. So again, they're just, they're trying to do things as efficiently as they can. Um, another question that we got was, what is the difference between a muskrat and a beaver? And we've been doing work here with beavers for, uh, since um, about 2004. Let me pull this one up, see if this works. <laughs> it's a little, <laughs> That is a little close up, but you get the idea. That's a, I'm holding a beaver kit right here. Um, and then we've started, we've been studying muskrats here for the last couple of years as well. So this is a great question for us because we're doing actively doing studies on both beavers and muskrats and how they interact with their environment. But both beavers and muskrats are rodents. They're both species of rodents, which includes things like rats and mice and squirrels, gophers, woodchucks, right? Those are all species of rodents. But otherwise, beavers and muskrats are not th that closely related. Muskrats are actually more closely related to rats and mice, and beavers are in their own special family because they're special, as we know. Um, an adult muskrat, so they're, they're big difference in size as well. An adult muskrat weighs about um, one to one and a half kilograms or two to three pounds, while an adult beaver can weigh up to 20 or to 30 kilograms or 50 or 60 pounds. So obviously, um, in terms of size, a much a huge difference between beavers 
um, and muskrats. But in how in their behavior, they're both aquatic rodents and they spend almost all their time in water. Um, they build huts um, made of sticks and other vegetation. They eat, they're, they're both herbivores. So in a lot of ways, they're very similar. All right, here's one, one other beaver question um, that I thought was interesting. Give me a second, I can change the background to this here. Okay, hopefully we can see this. All right, this is an x-ray of a beaver tail. Um, and what, so the question was, what do beavers use their tails for? Well, beaver tails are not, there's almost no muscle in the tail itself. It's all fat and connective tissue, and there's the spine that runs all the way to the tip. Um, so there's no muscles in the tail itself. But over here, you, this is at the base of the tail, there's all lots of very strong muscles that beavers can use um, to help move their tail like a rudder. So when they're swimming, the tail basically acts as a rudder. It's not, they don't use it like a fluke, like a whale, for example. They're, they don't, they're not able to flip their tail up and down to make them go through the water. That's what they have the web feet for. Um, so they use it as a rudder when they're swimming, which they do spend a lot of time swimming. Um, they also slap it on the water as communication, again, using those strong muscles at the base of the tail to whip, whip the tail up and down and slap it on the surface of the water to make a loud noise to, to either scare off predators or to alert um, other beavers of danger. It's basically a method for communication. And then they also use it um, for balancing. So when they stand up on their hind legs, the tail acts as sort of like a, like a tripod or a stand. Okay, all great questions about beavers. Let's jump back up to um, some more questions about some other wildlife. Um, let's see what I can put on here for now. I'll go back to the beaver lodge. Okay, so um, we'll, somebody asked a question about um, pelicans. So it says, tell us about the pelicans that live in the park there generally. What kind are they? Where do they live most of the time? It seems like they're most frequently seen in the spring. Are they just passing through? So what um, people are talking about here is they're seeing white pelicans. So let's see, there's two species of pelicans in the United States. White pelicans, which are generally freshwater, and then brown pelicans, which are tend to be um, in um, saltwater, so coastal areas. Um, there are no breeding colonies of white pelicans in Voyagers National Park. The closest um, you're going to have to here is in Lake of the Woods, which is a huge lake to the west of, of uh, Voyagers International Falls. And they have thousands of breeding pairs of pelicans there and cormorants as well. So the, corm or the pelicans that we see here in the park are either non-breeding pelicans. Um, so these are pelicans that are just um, juveniles that haven't matured enough to where they become breeding pelicans or they're migrants that we see in the spring or in the fall. So we get both of those. Great question though. Um, another question we got was about, um, what do bats do in the winter? So this is a great question. Um, so we have two broad types of bats that we have in Voyagers National Park. There's called um, tree roosting bats. Um, and these are bats that actually migrate like birds. So they don't spend the winter here in Northern Minnesota. Um, they go and spend the winters down in central United States or even northern Mexico. And these would be species like red bats, hoary bats, um, silver-haired bats, called tree roosting bats because when in the summertime they like to roost under the bark of trees. And then another broad species of bats that we have here are called cave roosting bats. Um, and these also don't spend the winter in Voyagers National Park. They're going to go and find what's called um, hibernacula. Uh, these are caves or mines or places where thousands of bats of the same species will congregate together to spend the winter. Um, and the nearest we have hibernacula we have are for little brown bats that is um, in the Iron Range um, in the Tower Sedan mine actually. Okay, um, another question here um, is about, this is the only question we got about amphibians, which is cool. So. How long does it take for a frog to fully grow? Well, in just a few weeks. Um, so basically frogs and toads and salamanders are all gonna go from an egg stage to some kind of a tadpole stage and then to adult frogs all within just a few weeks of that first summer that they are alive. So pretty quickly, 
much certainly much faster than a wolf or a moose or any other animal that might take many years to get to be adult size. Um, here's a great question that I had no real answer to. So why do loons have spots? Um, no idea exactly why loons have spots, but I guess an answer I would give is, um, you know, all the coloration patterns that we see in any animals, whether it's mammals or birds or amphibians, are, are likely a result of, you know, long evolutionary forces that made um, the color patterns of whatever animal you're looking at the most adaptive for its habitat. Or for its area, and in the case of loons, these spots, just like the other coloration on their feathers, probably have something to do with communication with other loons. So for breeding displays, um, it might have something to do with it. Sort of makes the black and white makes them maybe a little bit of camouflaged when they're on um, on the water. But um, I don't know the answer. My I, my guess is the, uh, some Google searching might show you that some other people have tried to answer that specific question, but. Um, another question here is that this one's about fish and, I, and as I explained earlier wildlife quote-unquote wildlife doesn't technically include fish but um, sometimes um, we and we do lots of studies on fish here in Voyagers National Park so the question was we like to fish what kinds of fish live in your park's waters uh, we have all of the common species of fish that people like generally like to fish for when they come here to Voyagers National Park so that's walleyes that's the state fish um, northern pike smallmouth bass, these are the ones, again, the really popular, most common fish. But there's also dozens of other species of fish, big and small, that live in the lakes and live in uh, small ponds and rivers and things. We have things as big as lake sturgeon, which get to be over 100 pounds, or again, lots of species of tiny little minnows that are only um, a half an inch long. So a, a large diversity of um, other fish species that live in our lakes here. Uh, let's jump back up to some more wolf questions. Um, there's a couple questions here about sort of what do wolves eat. Um, first question, what do wolf pups eat? So generally wolf pups are gonna be uh, like all mammals. Um, they're gonna nurse on their mother's milk until for the first part of their life. So in this case, uh, pups are gonna be nursing or eating small pieces of uh, regurgitated meat or um, even berries, insects, fish, whatever the adults bring back to them at the den until they're about eight to ten weeks of age. They're basically they're fully weaned at that point, they're no longer nursing, and then they're just feeding on whatever food is brought back to them by the uh, other pack members for the rest of the summer. So it could be a, uh, a leg from a deer, it could be a you know a part of a beaver carcass, it could be a um, a snowshoe hare or a squirrel or some other small game that they capture. And then by the end of that first fall, so by the time the pups are six, eight months old, they're going out and hunting with the other pack members and then helping to kill uh, prey and then just eating with the rest of the pack members. Um, this question says, my daughter Hayden, who's four years old, wants to know how young wolf pups are when they first begin to howl. Um, there's some great videos that are on the Voyager's Wolf Project uh, Facebook page, I believe Instagram as well, um, that um, that the project put out last year of wolf pups howling. So you can see, in this case, uh, the, as three to four weeks old already, wolf pups can come out and howl, and um, they're just practicing goofing around pretty much. But um, so if you go to the Facebook page, you should be able to find um, some videos of that from last year. That's pretty cute. Um, another question here, so about how many deer does a single wolf eat in a year? So this is a tough question to answer um, for a variety of reasons. Wolves in this part of Minnesota, they eat mainly white-tailed deer, as we know, um, but they also eat moose, they eat lots of beavers here, um, all kinds of other small mammals and birds, like I mentioned. And the diet of each of individual wolves can differ. So even wolves within the same pack might not always be eating exactly the same things depending on if they're if they're hunting together or not or if they're pups versus the adults and then different packs as well can have um, different diets so depending on maybe how much if some packs have a lot more deer and uh, beavers in them versus other packs that maybe have more moose then you're going to see differences in types of things that they eat and their diet changes dramatically over the course of the year um, 
in the summertime, wolves are eating lots of different things, beavers and um, young white-tailed deer fawns or moose calves, snowshoe hares, um, again, lots of beavers. This is when we've noticed them eating the blueberries. It's during the summertime. Very diverse diet. And then in the wintertime, again, the number of things that they have available to eat really shrinks down. And so that's when you see them mostly just eating white-tailed deer and maybe some snowshoe hares and a few other things that they can catch. So the question is difficult, but um, and it's going to vary quite a bit from pack to pack. So I don't want to throw out a number here because it's going to, it's highly variable. Okay. Um, Jackie or um, Megan, are we doing okay so far? You're still good. If you want to answer a few more questions, it's just 1225. Okay. Uh, let's jump down here to moose. I had some three questions about moose. You can kind of see him, I guess you can see the top of his head anyway. Um, so how many moose do we have in the park? This is a question we get quite often. Um, we, we do surveys every year to estimate how many moose we still have in the park. We don't, we have a very small population of moose here um, in, in Voyagers. This is um, kind of on the edge of what is called good moose habitat in Minnesota. If you go further east, say towards um, uh, the Arrowhead part of the state, so Ely, um, the North Shore, places like that, or if you go um, north into Ontario, those are places that are going to be, um, have more moose, higher densities of moose. But our population here, um, we estimate, and again, this is for most years that we've been doing the surveys, between 35 and 45 moose that live in the park. Most of these live in what's called the Cabotogama Peninsula, that's that roadless area in the middle of the park that we manage as wilderness. That's where the majority of our moose are found. Um, another question here was, do moose grow their antlers back like deer? And yes, it's, moose um, are in the deer family. They're the deer and moose and caribou and elk are all related. They're all in the deer family. So antlers are actually bone versus horns on say a cow um, or, um, or a sheep that's actually mo hair modified hair um, cells that grow into horns, and those do not fall off, but antlers do, antlers are different, they're bone that grows every year and then they fall off. And so um, moose antlers are actually considered one of the fastest growing tissues of any animal, so they can grow uh, from nothing um, to as up to 50 or 60 pounds of, of tissue that they put on their heads, that's a lot of weight, 60 pound set of antlers in, um, in just a few short months, so it grows amazingly fast. Um, then the other question we had here is how big is a baby moose when it is born? So as you can imagine for an animal this size, um, even when they're born, they're pretty big. So a newborn calf in, that, in the first couple hours after it's born, it's gonna be between 30 and 40 pounds and they grow very quickly. So they could be, they'll be over hundred pounds in a, just a couple, uh, maybe in seven to 10 days, they put on a lot of weight very quick. Um, Let's jump down here. There's a one question about bears. Um, question was, what type of bears do we have in the park? And then we, we had a couple of questions that were similar about bears. So the only species of bears that we have in the park are black bears. So this is the species that's native to Minnesota and the rest of the United States for, the, for that matter. Most states have black bears. Um, grizzly bears or brown bears is the bigger species that you find out west in the Rocky Mountains and in Alaska. There actually used to be grizzly bears in Minnesota, not this part that's Voyagers, but just if you go a little bit further west into what used to be the prairie, there were grizzlies in the prairie regions up until probably 150 years ago in Minnesota. Um, so to me, I find this interesting. Uh, polar bears is the, is the third species of bear that, that, um, that there is in um, North America and the United States. So if you go just 700 miles straight north of here, of International Falls, Voyagers National Park, you'll hit Hudson Bay and there's still, and there are polar bears in Hudson Bay. So that 700 miles is actually basically the same distance as International Falls to Chicago. So I kind of blows my mind that I'm as close to Chicago as I am to seeing uh, polar bears. Um, okay, I think what we have left is just a few last questions about wolves. So time-wise, I think we're actually doing pretty well. 
and we can um, maybe answer some other questions here at the end. That sounds good, some Steve. Some time. So three last questions here. What time of day are wolves most actively hunting? Um, wolves are generally thought of as um, crepuscular animals, and crepuscular just means that animals that are most active at dawn and dusk. So right, right around before and after sunrise, and then before and again um, after sunset. Um, but wolves actually will hunt most times of the day, you know, except I think when it's very hot out. So midsummer, you're not going to find wolves out hunting in, uh, in the, during the hottest parts of the day. So they usually be bedded down sleeping somewhere. But otherwise, they are kind of most of the time they're moving around. They're thinking about um, um, hunting and trying to find some food. So another common question that we get is what is the average lifespan of a wolf? Um, I heard uh, there's a, uh, a colleague of mine, a person that I know that studies wolves, who's, who used the phrase, it's tough being a wolf. Um, and this just means that um, wolves are, not only do they, again, they have to always be finding enough food, but they're trying to avoid fights with um, their own pack members, with members of other packs, um, or trying to avoid being killed by all the other things that happen to wildlife car accidents, um, poaching, legal um, hunting, all of those things. So um, it's, uh, it's a tough life being a wolf. It's not like it's not a Disney movie, that's for sure. So uh, most wolves generally, I would say, live less than four years. Um, but we certainly have seen wolves here in Voyagers that have, have lived to at least 10 years old and maybe even older. So that's, but that's definitely an old wolf. And by that time, their teeth are usually um, pretty well worn down and broken, and it gets pretty hard for them to make a living um, if you're a wolf and you don't have any teeth left. All right. Uh, last question that we have here is, do wolves hunt coyotes? So the, the word hunt there is probably um, is the key word. So um, basically, coyotes um, are the next member of the dog, next are a member of the dog family that's the next closest in size to wolves. Um, and because they're close in size, they sometimes eat the same thing. So coyotes eat things like uh, small beavers and snowshoe hares and grouse and deer fawns. Um, and those are also the things that wolves like to eat. And so in that sense, wolves um, consider coyotes to be competitors and they don't tolerate them. So they will kill coyotes whenever they get a chance. So um, in this part of Minnesota, where we have lots of wolves, we have very few coyotes just because there's not space for both of them. Now, if you go one step lower than that, so red foxes are, um, are another member of the dog family that wolves tolerate just fine because foxes are eating things that are totally different from wolves and they're really not competing. And so they don't bother with them too much. Okay, those are the questions that, um, that we had submitted as of um, before we started here this morning. So if there's other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Jackie, I'll let that you That is know. awesome, Steve. You made it through that huge list of questions and it looks like that we have them all answered. So just, is there anything else that you'd like to say about the animals and voyagers or we'll start wrapping up? Um, no, thanks for um, everybody's interest and um, we appreciate it. All right, thank you, Steve. And just for the viewers, we're gonna show you another place where you can go to find more information about Voyagers National Park Association or more kids activities. So you can go to our voyagers.org website. And if you'd look, like to find more kids information, you can go to Park at, park at Home and you can also find out more about becoming a member there. So thank you everybody for watching today.